And if you're coming in now, that's great. We're just going to watch like a little five minute home video of what happened this summer um, to give you a sense about what happened in our programs and why we're feeling so excited to share it with families and why we are feeling so confident about this model going forward. So I'll just start playing it. happy right now like I really love other cultures and I think when I think about what makes me most happy in life it's like I love getting to hear other people's stories I didn't know people were gonna be like from around everywhere like I thought it's gonna be a whole bunch of people like where I'm from but it's like everybody has their own background and identity which is so amazing like learning about it or just hearing about it was really awesome and we've had a lot of great uh, personal kind of discussions that are meant to be a little uncomfortable and awkward, but the whole group has been very kind to each other and pushing through that boundary. And it's been really great. He talks about how like privilege isn't like something that's given to you. It's like an invisible like thing that you don't see, but you have, which is really interesting because I've never thought about it like that, but I do have so much privilege and it was kind of eye opening. we had a discussion about climate justice and like I was totally able to connect to that because like I feel I, that has impacted me in spe especially the area I live in and just like growing up so close to like these plants and like them I can actually see the impact it has on my community and just like hearing everybody's interpretation about it was like wow yes let's speak up about it. We've been like going on excursions, hikes, um, like zip lining. Going on that last zip line with like the views, like it was insane being like high up in the jungle and just seeing everything, like it was insane. We went to a coffee farm, which was so awesome. And it's so amazing because it's run by a community and it's a small business, but it still like has this outreach. And I was like, wow, that's awesome. And then just learning about how this business works was like, wow, like my eyes were opened or something. It was still really cool. Another thing would definitely be the food. This is probably the, some of the greatest food I may have had this whole year. It's really good. This sounds so cliche, but I feel like I've grown so much since I've been here. Like learning from all the farmers in Monte Verde and then coming here to such like a unique community that I feel like I wouldn't have experienced otherwise has just given me so much new perspective and so many new ideas about like things I can do to implement like sustainable practices at home and to be more culturally aware and like aware of my privilege. A stop has been so welcoming with everything. We we have had so many great connections and conversations and just done so much with A stop. And you also just feel like you're learning so much. Like I didn't know so many things about turtles and what I can do being so far away from the things that are happening in other places, like what I can do when I get back home. So I feel like that was really helpful for me. It was so cool. I don't even know how to describe it because they were just like right there. There was a baby turtle like right there. And we like watched them like walk into the ocean and just like some, some people got to like even pick up the turtles and like put them onto the beach, which was like the absolute coolest. So we had a beach cleanup and it was just really nice. Honestly, it was really hot, but you know, that's a given. <laughs> um, and we just we just tried to tough through it and maintain a positive outlook, you know, because not every piece of community service that you're gonna do is gonna, it's not gonna be easy, you know, it's not gonna be like out of your comfort, you know, it's gonna be something that's for the betterment of the place that you're at. 
you know, when you talk to them and you ask like what I can do, you know, like that's based off of what they need rather than what we think we want to help them with. I think it's so cool to be in an environment abroad, not only that, but to be in an environment surrounded by people from all over the place with all different cultures and perspectives on life. And it makes me feel more connected to the world as a whole and more aware of global issues that we've talked about and especially like coming out of your shell from you know where you were before this trip is just doing things you've never done before, learning from people you've never met before. And I just think that's great. I wanted to go on this trip so that I can learn so much about the community and everything. And I did. I learned so much about the community, about turtles, about composting, about sustainability, about farming and ecotourism and everything. But I've learned so much about myself and like what I can do like to impact in a positive way the things that are happening. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on. Get the ad and replay and pause. Hi. So how was that? Um, I just love having to do all this thing. Hey. Um. Hi. Um. Uh, what was the age group? Hi, Hoya. Hey, Hoya. Am I wrong, or did your daughter Layla go this summer? She did. She did. She did. She went to yeah. Ecuador, like La Costa. Yes, ma'am. Oh, it's it. so great. And if I'm correct, like you and I have a shared, like you also have been staff in Amigos, right? And Amigos I Blog. Yep. Yes. Years. <laughs> well, thanks for trusting us with your daughter this summer. I hope she had a great time. How was it? She had the best time. She can't stop talking about it. And I believe she wants to go again this summer. Oh, we would love her to come back. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's so awesome. And could you mind me just putting on the spot a little bit? Like, what what do you see in her since she's come back? A huge amount of independence and a little more information about the rest of the world, obviously. Mm. Um, and I mean, she's launched back into school and trying to figure out how she can incorporate her attachment to Amigos into what she does this year. And I think she's still figuring that out, but it's been something she definitely doesn't want to give up during the school year either. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad. It's so awesome having another alumni. Like this was a really fun year because we actually had a lot of alumni from the 80s and 90s and their kids went. So we had like four or five, at least four or five. Um, which, exciting. It, right. And it, like my kids did it in 2018 and 2019. And it's like, it's just kind of very special when you've done Amigos and then your kids do Amigos. And you're just like, oh. yes just like so happy for them um oh well thanks Joe. you know what i'm gonna please empower like if i when we get to the coaster anything that i say jump on in this is it's great to have you here um oh this is so great so that is someone asked i think uh, you asked what was the age of that and the age of that this uh, that project's really interesting that project was called costa rica monte verde and we're actually running it again with a slightly different name I'm going to go through that project. Um, that was actually a project, the one project that we have in Latin America that doesn't have a hard Spanish requirement. So those kids typically were 15 and 16. Um, there were a couple 17 year olds in there, um, but they're usually kids who have maybe are in Spanish one or haven't done any Spanish. And I call it kind of the warm hug um, for high school students who are looking to do this, but they're not quite ready for the deep immersion where there's it's run bilingually and we've got Latin American youth. And the person who made that film, um, Zero Junta, he's been our longtime staff member in Latin America. He's actually now going to be our director of training. Um, and he has just got a, he's like got a very kind way with young people. So I often, in my role at Amigos, I see myself as a program counselor. So all the programs are great, but like depending on what you're looking for as a young person, what skills you have, what you need, what you're looking for from an experience. Um, I will kind of counsel you towards like, hey, your first time going abroad, big leap for you. Let's have you be with Zero in Costa Rica and the Monteverde program. Great place to get your, you know, like to get your confidence up. That was what this project was. And then for Joya's um, daughter, she went to kind of a tough project. She went to La Costa, Ecuador, which is a much harder, much more further away project. 
Um, and so somebody who has someone who has some Spanish, someone's ready to, to kind of lean out a little bit more. Each program has its own kind of strengths and values to it. So a lot of what I do, I'm going to present everything to you here, but it's a lot of content and I'm going to send it all to you as a PDF to follow up. And I'm going to offer a call um, so that we can talk it out and individualize it for your students. Um, or if you're the young person on the call right now, individualize it for what you're looking for. Cool. And like, um, feel free to drop questions into the chat that you really want to make sure you have answered. I'm going to be like, there's a lot of content coming at you in this info session. Um, and again, you don't have to take notes because I'm going to send you everything. I also have it recorded um, because it's a lot of content. And so I want to be able to offer the recording again, if you ever want it to go review with other people. Um, sometimes parents can't be here or the kids can't be on the call. And so we just always want to make sure we have that option that you can hear what I said. So now I'm going to try and share the screen <laughs> with the next thing. Let's see. Hold on. Um, anybody else on this call that has done Amigos before that I should know about? Um, really happy to, to know if there's anybody, any other alumni on here. That would be awesome for me. Okay, let's see if I can present this. All right, so I'm going to scroll through this pretty quickly. You are at the, I hope you know you're at the 2002 Amigos Explore Info Session. If you find your way here, um, hopefully you're where you're supposed to be. Um, and then let me do the next slide um, to, to back up a little bit. Um, we're going to talk about what happened in 2021, what we're doing for 2022, and kind of the next steps for getting involved. And then this is just like, hey, don't worry, there is a ton of information here. Just relax. It's all going to get sent to you. And, um, you know, we, I will create space for questions, but you can also try to drop them in chat too. Um, so for those of you who don't know anything about Amigos, um, well, we've been doing this for a very long time. Um, Amigos really carbon dates and predates the idea of youth service that has come in in the last 20 years. We don't do the work we do because it helps with college applications or is something you do for service hours. It does help with college applications and we do do service hours, but that's never why we have ever done this work. Um, Amigos started in 1965. We've been doing this for 56, 57 years. We have over 35,000 alumni at this point. We have a huge, huge, huge commitment to our Latin American communities, our Latin American youth. Very proud to say that in the last 10 years, Latin American youth have been a huge part of what we do. We're gonna talk about what that looks like this year. Um, and we're really about allowing young people to do audacious things and being adults who believe and trust them, train them, support them, but also getting out of their way so that they have the capacity to grow and see that in fact, they can change the world. And this was something that I experienced as a young person when I was 16 and 17 in our programs. And then in staff in um, college, I was a project supervisor and a project director in the end. And I just don't feel like at any point in my life I've ever had so much training support and faith in me to be able to lead and make change. And it was um, such a powerful thing. And I'm like, I'm so excited that Layla wants to go back. And I think that's probably what, like for those of us who really believe in this organization, it's such a joy to lean in as a young person and realize there's leadership ladders. So we really want you to know that you could be not just a volunteer, but we have a lot of pathways after Amigos to stay involved and to continue to lead in your community. Um, and that's really what we're about. You know, our mission is to inspire leaders young leaders and leaders who are generational um, throughout authentic service and immersion experiences. And what immersion experiences means to us is that surrender to the moment and to the place of where you are, to learn that you can do hard things and move through hard emotions like homesickness and dislocation to find meaning and connection and purpose. Um, and when you find that, that's where real resilience um, and real kind of belief in oneself is found. I think Amigos has affected me in giving me um, what some people think is a very optimistic view of world. I actually don't think I'm very optimistic. I think I'm just very realistic. And I think we can do amazing things because when I was a teenager, I learned that I could do amazing things with my group and with my community. And so it never feels optimistic. It just feels realistic to do great things together. Um, so that's who we are. <laughs> we are a nonprofit organization. We've been doing this for a long time. We're deeply committed to our um, countries. We're going to be in Costa Rica. 
where we've been for over 30 years. And we're going to be in Ecuador, where we've been for over 50 years this summer. And we also have a new program in Colorado, which I am so excited to show up. So let me just talk very briefly about, you saw the video, you kind of saw what it looked like. Um, but just to back up a little bit, to think about 2021 programs, we really had to think about what we built the need to. Um, in Amigos in 2020, we paused our in-person programming because of COVID. We created these really beautiful online platforms that many, many hundreds of youth ended up signing up for, where we brought Latin American youth fully funded into our programs and North American youth brought them together in platforms to do Spanish practice, cultural exchange, kind of deep listening, and then create service projects in their own communities with support from each other. 2020 was awesome at Amigos. We like pivoted, we innovated, we, we learned we could do things we didn't think we could do. But in 2021, we were also really aware because we were staying so close to young people in these platforms about how devastating the isolation was becoming for them. Um, and we saw that young people truly needed to get out of behind screens and get back to being in person together. So very thoughtfully, we developed a, a, the safest program we could come up with. We called it a pod model to mimic what was happening in schools. Um, and that's what we built to, and that's kind of what you saw. Um, and so what was so exciting about this program is we were able to take 223 North American youth and 19 Latin American youth together for powerful immersion programs. So we did it. Like we did it. We brought them all together. We were able to fully fund Latin American youth participations to take roles in our programs. And it was fantastic. It really was something that was amazing. Um, a lot of my work in August and July was doing debriefing calls with volunteers who had gone in June and August, June and July. And so I would open up the Zoom calls like, hey, listen, I'm just here to do some deep listening, you know, give you a chance to process what you experienced. So let's just start at the beginning. How was your summer? <laughs> like every person is like, it was amazing. And I'm like, wow, well, okay, why was it amazing? And they're like, it was the people. I met the most amazing people. And that has just been 95% of every call starts with, it was amazing, it was the people. Um, and it just, it, as a parent of two teenage boys who've gone through the cascade of disappointments in the last year and a half, it feels so good to be part of an organization that's been able to provide something so positive for young people. Um, oops. All right, so where do we go? We went to the mountains, the rivers, and the forests of the Western Slope of Colorado, and that program is next level. I'll talk about it more in a little bit. We went to La Sierra, the highlands of Ecuador. That's a pretty amazing project. You're up at about 7,000, 8,000 feet. It's cold, and you're living with indigenous families and on communities that are um, very rural. Um, then we also went to the lowlands and the coasts of um, Ecuador and La Costa Project, really looking at what's happening around climate change and climate change adaptations there. Um, we went to Nicaragua, which was really exciting. We were out into the rural areas of Nicaragua looking at what was happening around renewable energy and renewable energy sources. So really going and finding out how communities deal with and adapt to an unstable power grid and how they come up with um, the kind of localized solutions. So we were there to learn and support that. Oops. And then, oh, then we went to Costa Rica and we were full on in Costa Rica. We had three projects where we were on coffee farms, we were on the coast, um, on the Limon side, the Caribbean side, and up Monte Verde um, and Zeladon, which are the, really the forest areas. And so here's something that, you know, whenever we do our programs, we're really interested in finding out what the impact is on young people. So we have this leadership survey and you know, people take it at the beginning before they go, and then we do a comparison at the end, right? So they take their final leadership survey. We just sat down with the staff and did a deep dive into like all the categories and everything that how it came out. But there was one thing that we just feel stood out so strongly with all the 90s and the 95s and all the you know happiness. Something to me really powerful happened. 97% of our volunteers agreed with this statement that they feel more confident in their abilities to work effectively with people from diverse ethnic and cultural backgrounds. I cannot think at this moment in time in our history of a more important skill and value that we're able to develop in young people. I am so excited to see that this particular statement was one that was so highly regarded and highly um, kind of elevated in the program experience. So I just wanted to highlight that the survey results were amazing, but this one stood out to me as being something I wanted to share with everybody. 
So we're not going to do anything too differently. We are so happy to iterate just a bit on the successes we had, but it's not really the moment for us at this point to go back and look at doing homestays and deep immersion. We know this program is extremely safe for all involved, for our staff that develop it, for our volunteers that go, and honestly, most importantly, for the host communities that welcome us. Uh, we work with multi-generational communities. We work with vulnerable populations. Uh, vaccine rates in Costa Rica and Ecuador are gaining steam right now, and that's wonderful to see. But they, they are not where we feel comfortable, where we can actually explore doing anything different than what we're doing in these group programs. If things change, we'll look at iterating something differently in the spring. But for right now, this is what we're offering. And it's great. So we feel like, <laughs> like we're, we're excited to do this. All right. So one commonality, before we get into the separate themes of the projects, there are a couple of things that are deeply common about everything we do, whether we go to Colorado or Ecuador, or Costa Rica, Nicaragua, anywhere. In every project area, what we are there to do is actually learn from how communities identify challenges and work to the needs of those challenges. What innovations did they come up? What co collaborations, what cooperations? You know, we are definitely not ever the program that comes in and wants to half build a schoolhouse because we wanna use this community as a Petri dish for our service learning. That is the antithesis of everything we do at Amigas. Um, Really, we come in in a sense of humility and learning from what communities understand about themselves. And then as we are in that place of deep respect for the opportunity to be there, we want to ask, how can we safely be of value and support the work that's being done there? So it doesn't matter where we go. These are the two questions that are the most prominent in our minds. Let's go to the next slide. So, you know, service learning, what does service le learning mean? Like, what, is, what do we think service learning is? And we have three pillars in Amigos. It's service, putting your hands in, being a participant. It's leadership, which is taking really, leadership really means taking responsibility for your role and your space and who you are in the world. And then the pillar that I personally love the most is the cultural humility pillar. Um, that is that deep level of respect coming into a community, understanding that they know more than we ever will know. And we're privileged just to have the moment to sit there in that space and learn from them. So a big part of service learning in Amigos though, isn't just the hands-on service and the skill building, but we're only there, especially for this program, it's only a three week program. So these programs are only three weeks. There's a lot of reasons why that is, and I can go over them, but that means this really is almost a, a preparation for you to, as a young person to come back and think about how you're going to do change in your community. As we go and look and see how people are making change in communities in Colorado and Latin America, it's not meant to be a flat experience. It's meant to be one that sparks in you, your capacity, your desire to be like the people you have met. What we want to put in front of you is role models of hope. So that you come back and you're like, I wait, I see something I care about here and I can do something about it. So part of our service learning is the support and the hope that you'll come back and do that. So sometimes people say, well, what, what are you doing? Like, what does service look like in three weeks in a group project? And I think that's great. So I just wanted to throw up here some ideas of like what to expect from service and some excursions that we do. Um, we'll dive, we can dive in much more into this, but um, one thing that you're going to see is, you know, be tempting to see the sea turtle nurseries. It's, it's like so fun to see them. But here's, here's why we're working in sea turtle nurseries. Uh, well, climate change has caused a rise of water levels on the beaches on the Caribbean coast. The water levels are higher. Um, the turtles being ancient creatures have not gotten that memo. So they are, they are um, laying their eggs in the traditional places where they have for millennia. But those nests are getting washed out. So part of our job is to go support the agencies that are already there and move the nests after that they've been laid higher up on the beach to protect them from um, being washed out. So that's part of the hands-on service, the reason why we're doing it and what we're doing. And then we know we do do some night patrols on the beach, which is walking around at night because there's still poaching of eggs in Costa Rica by um, 
by folks. So we walk around with the guides um, and just kind of stay as a lovely presence on evening walk on the beach to make it a little bit less discouraging for someone to go dig up those eggs on the beach. In Western Colorado, um, I love this project so much. Um, and a lot of what we do is really hands-on work around trail creation, the actual building of trails to create better, safer access, looking at what's happening around the politics of water and fire and those resources, going and actually doing seed pod distribution in our areas. We do a rafting trip with an environmental group where we go and actually do water collection and look what's happening with the health of the Arkansas River. And that Arkansas River goes down and feeds many different states and communities. And we get into the politics a little bit of water resources in the West. Um, and in Ecuador, one of the things you're looking at is what's happening with hurricanes, the increase of hurricanes on the coast of Ecuador. Um, the increase of hurricanes takes down the mangrove forests. Mangrove forests are a natural kind of barrier and protect the beach and erosion. They're also a place where baby fish get a chance to grow before they go out into the sea and become big fish. So when hurricanes destroy the mangrove forest, it creates a, a, an, up, up, an upheaval in all kinds of um, ecosystems there. So part of what we're doing is to go look and see how we can be supportive of that. So that's like some of what we do on these projects. And then I just want to like, we all can dive much more into this if you decide to apply, but we think of this program as being divided into three time pieces. The pre-departure, which is now, the counseling are talking about it, the training that would happen either in a local chapter or in a national chapter. A lot of it will be online, but some might be in person. Um, and then the, the first part, um, phase one, is when you first come into country. When we first come into country, we do a quarantine time all together. So it's the first five days. And during that time, we do we make good use of that time, but we don't leave our briefing site. On day five, we all take a COVID test and pending a negative result. Then we can take our masks off with each other within our group, but we always put our masks and use social distancing when we leave and go into communities and do service work. And that service work happens between day six and day 21. Um, this worked really well. Uh, we did a really good job. And I'm really, we're really proud that we have a safe model to offer. So a pod or a group is a three-person staff team, including a full-time health and wellness coordinator. That person is trained to really be, I want to say, micromanaging the health of the volunteers. So sniffles, uh, fevers, anything that would normally come up, that person is uh, deeply focused on. They're doing daily health checks. They're the ones that are managing the border, really the boundaries between communities and our volunteers. So they make sure there's always social distance masks, everything like that. Um, and they're also looking at the mental health of volunteers. There was a lot of stress this summer. It had been a while since young people had been together in groups. And so the health and wellness coordinator was really working closely on monitoring the mental health of our volunteers in 2021. The group size, as you can see, 15 to 20 volunteers, almost all are Latin American programs are bilingual pods or bilingual groups. That means two Latin American youth are immersed in the entire experience, fully fund those young people. It's great, we love them. And we don't choose them based on their ability to speak English. They're just incredible young people from their communities, which means everything, every program is run bilingually, which is great. A lot of times our staff, so Layla, I think in Ecuador, I think all three staff members were actually from Ecuador. You know, like the Latin American leadership ladder is really, we're bringing Latin American youth into every level of leadership in Amigos. Um, and it means, we'll talk about the Spanish classes, but there are Spanish classes in all of our programs. But this, this Latin American youth piece was really fantastic. Um, since we can't do homestays, we kind of wanted to bring the homestay into the project. Um, and then accommodations. Group living sites, you know, gender dorm, gender summer dorms and rooms. And, um, you know, I wanted to just to dig in a little bit deeper on what is a bilingual pod option. So just to, this slide is right here, I'll like really lay it out. Bilingual program options are for volunteers who have two years of Spanish or more and want to go deeper into Spanish language acquisition. They want that dislocation of not understanding everything that's happening sometimes because it's run bilingually. These Spanish focused programs includes formal Spanish instruction and two Latin American youth. It's the Costa Rica, Cartoga, Carto, Cartago, and Caribe. They don't have the Spanish language, which means they won't have the Spanish, they won't have the Latin American youth, but they do still have Spanish classes. So Spanish classes are in everything, but that is the one project that doesn't have the um, Latin American youth in it, and it's not run bilingually. So you do not have to have a hard Spanish requirement to join. 
So just to go back to like what to expect in that first phase one, the first six days uh, is great. We're all coming together. Everyone's gotten off the plane. You could see in that first video, they're all kind of tired and the staff is there coming up the airport. Those first five, six days are really spent about going back to the briefing site, learning about the specific place you are, practicing Spanish, finding out the living responsibilities. So, you know, one thing you could ask um, Layla is like, what were the leadership things she was expected to do in the group? I've really enjoyed finding out how the staff really deputized our volunteers in terms of like the roles that they had as leaders in, in their group, whether they were the ones in charge of social media blogs or the ones in charge of doing the evening activities or the ones in charge of helping do cleanup and packing buses and making sure everything was, you know, like cleaned up and ready to go or supporting with the cooking and the cleaning. You know, this isn't a bougie project. Young people are expected to step up and take a lot of responsibility for themselves and for the group experience. And that gets set up and explained and really like start lived in that first time. Um, and then I want to give you an example. Like people are like, what does a briefing site look like? It looks like this. You know, like they're all meant to be kind of outdoor spaces so people can hang out, be in the hammock, relax, enjoy themselves. I do want to say from the very beginning, there, we have a very strict tech policy. So volunteers are allowed to bring their phones and the phones go in this little locked pocket. And then twice a week for a few hours in the evenings, they're allowed to take them out and use them to text and call people, to check social media, to post. So there's about four to five hours of, of phone use allowed a week. And that's about it. And I would say from talking to the volunteers and seeing evaluations from them, they felt very freed up. Um, by having that, like, they knew they would have some time, but it was no longer this thing that was this obligation, this heaviness. So our tech policy is one, I think, one of the biggest successes of the program experience. People felt really um, lightened because they didn't have it. All right, in phase two, which we kind of talked about, now the, we've all had our COVID test, everyone's negative. We can be one big group together within the pod without having our mask on, but once we go out, we have masks on. And that's where we're going to start doing things and going places and helping out and being productive and engaged with the community outside. Um, and that goes from day six to day 21. All right. And for those of you who don't know, I mean, Amiga's health and safety is kind of a, it's kind of its own monster. It's an amazing part of our organization. We have a full-time director of health and safety. We have staff in country right now, both in Ecuador and Costa Rica programs. We are deeply committed to using group models, very strict COVID protocols and testing, um, different and new staff models and training and education to keep young people safe. I can go into this ad nauseum, but I just want to tell you that we normally take few people and put them in rural villages without phones. So in some ways, this is an easier program for us to manage around health and safety. I think one of the reasons why we have it at three weeks and why not longer is two reasons. Three weeks is a really great amount of time for young people to be together and still like each other. Once you get into four and five weeks, the group dynamics become more important than the actual work that we're doing. So three weeks is that really sweet spot. And then three weeks is a good amount of time to keep everyone safe. You know, more that we're there, the more the chances are for um, community spread. So we feel like three weeks is a nice tight um, time and it's really part of our health and safety decision to do it like that. All right, I'm gonna just pause for a second. I think I see a question coming in. Are there any longer sessions? Hi, Reed, there are no longer sessions at this point for, the, for ages 15 to 19 on the Summer Explorer. We have gap programs in the spring and the fall in Costa Rica and in Ecuador. Those are eight weeks. We don't have a gap summer program right now because honestly, we're pretty busy doing this Explore program. So, and we didn't really see like a big need for it. People weren't that interested in it. And we really wanted to just focus on doing a good job with Explore. So we do not have longer programs. I say that now, depending, here it is September, depending if things are going incredibly well in the world in its January, we might look at doing maybe a four week or a five week extended program, but we won't build that until we feel it's safe. And at this point, our program staff, both in country and out of country have decided that it's not safe enough yet to look at longer based programming. So thanks for that question, it's a good one. Krista? Yeah, hi. It's test positive for COVID while on program last summer. And if so, like, what's the basic way that you handle that? Yeah, no, that's that. Let's talk that out. So we had um, two volunteers test with COVID. 
we have COVID test testing kind of all the time. So we were constantly going, you know, if someone has a, unfortunately, GI and respiratory are things that we would normally see in any normal summer when you travel. People get diarrhea and people get colds, but those are also COVID. So uh, we tested constantly. We basically had a, a relationship with a clinic near our communities and we would test anybody that we thought had any of the you know, one to two symptoms. Uh, no one tested, one person tested positive. We think they actually got it on international travel too, because they showed up, they had the test positive on the day five. Um, they tested negative on day seven. So we're not sure if that was an issue with testing because they had, they were asymptomatic. Another person tested positive on their way. So before we go back to the US, everyone tests. One person out of a group of 20 tested positive. The rest of the 19 did not test positive. Um, and so that person stayed in country with our staff, did a quarantine uh, for seven more days until they tested negative and they went home. What we noticed was we saw no community spread, which was what we were so excited about seeing. So once we, with those two people, we had to really worry about, was there any community spread? Did anyone come home and have COVID from being exposed? We didn't see any evidence of that. We did have one staff member um, test positive for COVID. And we think they got that when they were taking a volunteer to the clinic. Um, cause they came up with, they became symptomatic three days after they had done that they tested positive for COVID. Now here's an interesting thing, about 85%, we required vaccinations and about 85% of our volunteers were vaccinated at the time. This was of course early June when not everyone could get vaccinations because about half of our staff members are from Latin America. Latin American staff didn't have the same capacity to get vaccinated. So we had 55% of our staff which meant basically 100% of our North American staff and a few of our Latin American staff could be vaccinated. That's already going up. We're already seeing our Latin American staff are able to access vaccinations. So we anticipate a better outcome for next year because we get to see the deeper levels of vaccination rates and booster rates, I think we're gonna probably see. But that is what happened. We had two volunteers and one staff person with no community spread. And Given, given what was happening in travel in the United States, that was that's pretty good. Um, we feel really we feel really good about those those um, numbers. Um, we of course wanted none, but I think what we're excited about was no one was really sick. Uh, no, every there was no community spread, and that was the thing we were the most committed to. Cool. Any questions about that? I think that's a it's a great question, and I, I embrace the question as I think it's important to share what the results were. This is a good moment before I dive into 2022. If anyone else wants to, like, you know, jump in with a question, because um, I'm about to talk for like 15 minutes about like all the things. So, Could, anything so else? Got, this yeah. is a link. Um, yes, I'm interested in the, uh, my daughter's interested in the Los Santos um, trip to Costa Rica. I just can't tell um, if that's one of the trips that's more of a, um, an immersion. We're looking for more of a Spanish. It is. It she's is. Spanish at home and she, um, and she takes Spanish in her school and, and she's ready to talk to people in the community. Absolutely. That's a perfect project for her. That has two Latin American youth. It's run bilingually. Um, it has Spanish classes as well in it to support kind of the idiomatic and vocabulary that we're going to learn around the coffee farms that probably no one has really learned. <laughs> There's some idiomatic conversation you need to know if you're going to live on a coffee farm. Um, but yeah, that's absolutely it. And that's, a, if there's no more questions, I'll start kind of diving into that project. Anybody else, any more questions before we start learning specifics? I, this is great. Oh, I have a quick question. So you have like a hard Spanish requirement and I want to do more of like an immersion trip, but like, what is like the bare minimum amount of Spanish that you have to speak to go on like one of the immersion trips? Great. So I would say the bare amount is, is two years of um, janky high school Spanish. And let's just acknowledge the fact that if you were trying to take Spanish last year on Zoom class, this was the worst. So our poor students were feeling very insecure about their Spanish, right? We had sophomores and juniors who were like, I've spoken on Zoom, I don't feel confident, but they did great in these immersion programs. And again, the immersion programs do have, they're run bilingually, so they are run in half in English, half in Spanish. They do have Latin American youth in them. 
and they do have the formal Spanish classes. So it's really the time when you're like, I don't think I understand what's happening. You can turn and get the support from that from the rest of the people in your group or from someone who has a little bit more capacity in the group. Um, 88% of our volunteers, one of the categories that we asked is, do you feel more comfortable speaking fluently in Spanish? 88% rated it excellent for increasing their um, Spanish abilities. You do not want to go to Costa Rica, Cartago, and Caribe, though, because that's the one where you'll be, it's really Spanish light, you know, it's intro to Spanish. Um, so that would not be the challenging project for you. But Los Santos is a great one. Um, almost everything else is great. And we can kind of dive into that. Actually, Joya, do you mean asking, how did Layla feel about her Spanish? She felt like she got a lot out of it. Her Spanish is so much better. And um, she's a lot less, she's a lot more fearless about using her Spanish. Um, She had previously two years of middle school and two years of high school Spanish. But, you know, I honestly think that there's nothing like speaking with others in Spanish to teach you Spanish. Right. Yeah. So there's, a, and there is a wide range. There might be like Alita said, like there are people who come in very deeply fluent and there are people who come in who have two years of high school Spanish and a little bit of like self-consciousness about speaking. That's okay. We're used to that. Amigos. We play a lot of games. We do a lot of things like dynamic. We do a lot to release inhibitions and create a safe group. So that everyone recognizes you're you're moving forward and progressing in your Spanish to the level which you started at. And no one, this is not a competition or a race. There are no grades. One of the things I love about Amigos, uh, it's a it's a great place to go if you're a little ADHD because there's no testing. It's not Spanish classes where we're going to go over the gerund versus infinitive or the you know the conditionals. It's meant to be playful and youthful and conversational. Um, we're really looking at like you enjoying and laughing a lot. I think that's the thing that I come out of this is a lot of people laughed and they felt comfortable and safe with each other. That's something that's come out a lot. Actually, one of the things that's kind of sad that's come out, honestly, is as I'm doing this debriefing, people are like, oh, I'm back in high school and I don't feel like as safe as I did in Amigos. I feel like I have to like cover myself up a little bit. And with Amigos, I could just kind of let it like be my authentic, goofy self. So that's just part of what we do to help people gain the confidence to speak in a different language than they might be used to. So I hope that helps. All right, let's dive in. You guys are so great. Let's dive into the program. Ah. Sorry, it's hard for me to see on this little computer about where we are in this program. Program, oh yeah, this is the good stuff. All right, so let's go into Los Santos. Let's dive right in. All right, love this project was, okay, there's a, there's a couple things I'm gonna warn you on. Some projects are more popular than other projects. I don't know if it's gonna stay true. I'll just tell you what happened. This project filled up really fast. So I imagine it's gonna fill up really fast this year. So I just wanna give you a heads up that if you want this project, I would say you probably want to get an application in by the end of October. Um, because let me just be clear, there's only eight, we're not trying to bring a thousand kids to Latin America. We brought 223 North American youth. We're probably going to bring in about 300, maybe 310 this year. That's not a lot. Um, and in this project, this is a two-year Spanish required. So it's your bilingual program. It's got two Latin American youth. There are two of the 20 spots. So there's really only 18 open spots for session A and 18 open spots for session B. That's it. Not for like Houston or California, like that's it. From everybody who's applying to Amigos from all over the country, that's only 18 spots. So those 18 spots go really fast. Um, So I do want to like say that that's something to think of. What's really great about this project is you kind of stick the landing. Um, some projects we move around a little bit to see different things. In this one, you're really staying put in the areas of Prez Elijan, which is up in the hills and a little bit of the lower mountains of Costa Rica in the center of the country, where they do a lot of work around coffee production. So the theme of this is food justice and coffees and communities. And really what we do is do a bit of a deep dive. And that's what's nice is we can really dig into themes in this group project. What does it mean when you buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks? What impact does that have for a community that actually grew that crop? What, is, what do people make 
what is happening on the agricultural economic level, what happens with price fluctuations, demand fluctuations. So there's some economics, but really how then in Costa Rica, are they coming up with solutions around that, like creating cooperatives, like working on fixing pricing, like supporting each other um, and not competing with each other and creating more of a cooperative economic system. Um, and then the other interesting thing is how does coffee production coexist with agroforestry and what's happening with the redevelopment and the increase of national forests? Um, oh, and then along with that, how does coffee production handshake with ecotourism, which is really a beautiful way for communities to get a secondary benefit um, from growing one coffee, from growing one thing. If they're growing coffee, you're not very diverse, but when you can bring in ecotourism or have natural preserves nearby and hanging bridges, you can create more diversity in the local economies. And then another interesting thing about this is diving into some of the gender issues around justice. So coffee has been a male dominated industry all over Latin America. And in Costa Rica, there's a real pushback on that. And there's been a series of women's collectives that have created um, women's led coffee firms. And we really wanna dive into what the gender issues are around that. So an amazing program with Latin American youth, uh, bilingual, um, really living and working on coffee farms and finding out how the production of a single crop affects people all the way down to the local level. This is a just an extremely wonderful project. It had got high reviews. Everybody had a great time. Um, if this is something you want, I would not wait too long and sit on the fence, but look at getting an application in um, within a month or so. Because if you think there's only one, like if it's session A, you can only do or session B, those spots are going to fill up pretty soon. Um, all right, and then we're going to go into what we saw in that video. This is the non-Spanish required. This might be something like uh, a freshman would do or a junior who basically hasn't traveled before and wants to do something or someone who's really into outdoor bio. A lot of this one, can I just say you're doing a lot of outdoor bio between working at the sea turtle sanctuaries and also working. Um, did you see in the video that they were taking water samples? They're doing the same thing we're doing in Colorado. They're doing outdoor bio where they're looking at the quality of the water and the organic matter in the water to assess the quality of the water as it goes downstream. So great project. We are gonna be taking this to a lot of environmental clubs across the United States and to AP bio classes to see if somebody would like to go down and see what is happening in Latin America around really exciting work for um, community driven conservation. Um, and we have a bilingual program that does the same thing. So. It's the same program experience. Um, it's got different titles and different names, but it's the same. So if you're like, wait, I love all those ideas you're doing, but I want the Spanish and the Latin American youth and the bilingual piece, great, we have this for you. Montanis Amar, different dates, same experience, um, going to two different parts. You're gonna be going to the rainforest areas and seeing what's happening around river water, coffee production, and difference now in rainfall, and then going to the Caribbean coast to work with the turtles. So this. That's a little bit of the best of both worlds if you want to have that outdoor kind of ed biology hands-on conservation work, but also have the Spanish and the Latin American youth. So again, popular projects, 18 spots, not a lot. Um, definitely something I would be mindful of um, signing up for. This program, um, I will, I like to put a little caveat. This is a hard program. This is not a program that I counsel people to go to if they have not traveled before, um, if they are looking for that really restorative ecosystem engagement um, experience of being in Costa Rica and seeing what it's like to have butterflies as big as your face walk around and being in a country that's like deeply invested into environmental protection, that's Costa Rica. Ecuador has its own history, its own legacies, and this is a harder project. It's at 8,000 feet. You're living on two community farms and working in farm work that develops um, kind of crops that go directly to indigenous villages. So this is a tough place to live for indigenous people. It's hard, um, hard scrabble life. There's, it doesn't, it's not easy and food security is a big issue. So this is another program where I don't recommend if you're a vegetarian or a vegan, that is, may not be able to be accommodated because when we go into communities and we're coming in in that place of humility, we eat what they eat. And if they're offering us their food and if it has meat or if it's got a, a stew that has meat in it, we have to accept that. So when we always want to say like, if you're a vegetarian, Costa Rica is a great place. This project, we just, you need to really be in a place of like surrender into what the community is and 
and understand that that's going to be an amazing experience. It is also pretty cool because it's a bilingual program with two Latin American youth from Ecuador um, in that project. Um, I think particularly what's exciting for those of you who want to lean out and try something different is that you get to be a part of a community and learn from deeply held ancestral traditions and beliefs that are very different than you might see in Central America or throughout other parts of Latin America. Uh, you probably learn Quechua. There's Quechua classes. Half the population that we're working alongside don't speak Spanish. They speak Quechua. Um, there is such a powerful um, sense of self and sense of history in these communities. Um, one of the cool things that our volunteers talked about was going to shamanic ceremonies and being blessed by shamans and being in ancient rituals well before um, Christians have come here and, and introduced Catholicism. So that piece is an incredible piece. I love this program for someone who's done Amigos before and wants to come back for the next level or someone who really is compelled by these issues and is very flexible and maybe has some uh, previous travel experience. Um, and then La Costa, which is what Leila did, which is on the coast of Ecuador. That is also a Spanish program. Again, this has two Latin American youth embedded in the program, Spanish, formal Spanish classes, great place to practice Spanish. Um, in this area, you know, we talked, I mentioned a little bit before about the mangrove forest re reforestation. It's also a really cool thing that we do is we're able to um, actually do an excursion out to an island that's part of a marine section, marine marine sanctuary and see what happens what's happening around that level of protection on the southern coast um, they're doing an amazing job of really working on a, a small level of trying to protect spaces that gets overfishing so we get to actually go see that see find out what happens there we also get to go do community service at a, at an area where most people don't know there are actually indigenous populations that are coastal indigenous populations we often think of Kind of the Indian Andean areas, but there's actually coastal indigenous populations. So one um, one service day is actually working those communities, supporting um, youth driven initiatives there. And actually, you should ask Layla what she thought about that. A lot of people really like that. I think they all got their um, butts handed to them in a soccer game with the local youth. I've talked to a couple of the guys who were in that project, and they're like, these guys came and just whooped us in soccer. Um, but that is a great program. Love it off the beaten path. This is not a community that you're ever going to be able to access unless you're with Amigos. There's no other service programs that go down to the Slip Coast area because it's kind of near the border of Peru on that western, uh, western slide. All right. And then the United States program, no Spanish required. Although what's exciting about this program, we piloted for the first time. We're really committed to bringing uh, Latin American youth up into this program. We're just figuring out a grant that we can bring some of our volunteers who were in Costa Rica last year to Colorado this year to join our North American volunteers. With us. But that said, it's not going to have a Spanish requirement. Um, and I, why I love this program possibly the most. I know I shouldn't have to vote. Um, but I kind of do. And part of it is in a lot of what the work I do, people say, Krista, why do young people have to go out of the country to have a transformational service learning experience? Why do they, why can't we do cross-cultural exper like experiences here in the United States? And I agree with that. We've always agreed with that in Amigos. We just didn't have the capacity to build this program and COVID gave us a breathing room and then we could build it. Um, what I love about this program is that we have some serious issues around environmental protection and stewardship, as well as understanding people of different backgrounds, different political backgrounds, different um, economic backgrounds here in the United States. And we dive right into that in this program. So we're gonna be looking at wildlife conservation, challenges and successes, doing things like what's happening around wolf reintroduction in Colorado? How did something pass by 5149 the 50, so wolf reintroduction in Colorado passed three years ago. It's now being implemented. Unfortunately, it's a divisive issue in the state. And the part of the state that voted on it, the rural areas don't want it. They're voted against it. The urban areas voted for it. So now we have an environmental policy that's not really embraced in any way by the population that must manifest it. That's something to learn about. Where are these collaborations and cooperations working well? Um, what is happening in Colorado is a microcosm for what's happening in the West and really in conservation in our own country. Another part of the cultural humility piece is understanding the indigenous histories of people in this area, the original stewards of the land. 
Uh, we do things like go to the Denver Museum, look at artifacts, question how those artifacts came to be, go to the National Parks representation of an indigenous village, see what that looks like. Hashtag it's kind of sterile. And then we go and spend the day with tribal elders in the Ute Mountains to learn from them how they feel about their history being representation and get a very different sense of what their history is. Um, learn things that we've never, we never really have access if we weren't in a place of learning and humility to do service and learn from them on their reservation. I could not be more proud of the fact that we've pivoted to do this program and that we have this option now for youth here in the United States. So I just want to, I know for all of you who are looking for a Spanish immersion program, this is not it, but please keep in mind that this, there's something very special happened in this program. It had 100% satisfaction rates. Everybody who went felt like it was life-changing for them. And so we are bringing this forward into next summer with great confidence.